basic outline of your role. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get asked this a lot by people inside the BBC, <laughs> let alone outside it. So the title is uh, Controller of Daily News Programmes. So there's lots of different areas in the BBC from current affairs like Panorama and uh, Newsnight. There's digital programmes, the channel, world, online. But mine is probably not the most familiar programmes. So the 6 and 10 o'clock news, TV breakfast, all the Radio 4 news programmes like Today programme, um, all the 5 Live news, World Service news programmes, Asia Network. All those programmes have a team. In fact, behind us you'll see the 610 team. They have a boss, an editor, and effectively I am the, those bosses' boss. So if you think of a pyramid, in this pyramid I'm there and the sort of programmes are underneath me under their editors. Right. Um, you previously worked as an editor. Yeah. Um, how does your current role differ on a day-to-day -day basis? I suppose that in some ways it's quite frustrating because if you're in charge of a programme, it's kind of it's your toy, it's your thing to do whatever you want to do with. And therefore if you choose to chase this story or want to pursue that interviewee or yeah. do this discussion, you do it. It's your decision, you're in charge. And with the role I have now, I have an overview of those programmes and obviously can intervene. But you're not in the day-to-day -day moment of it all. So therefore you're slightly detached from the sort of news chasing, the sort of um, kind of the fun of the journalism at one level. Um, but equally, what you can do is dip into all those things and try and influence it. And you know, what you're trying to strike is a balance between being yet another boss to the teams and sort of contravening what the editor wants to do. Yeah. Is it quite hard, would you say, to to be able to kind of come at, with these all with these different shows with a kind of different mindset to each one and be able to kind of keep them all within the same with the, the BBC mind frame? So. That's the kind of fun of it, I think, actually. I mean, you know, something that works on Five Live isn't necessarily going to work on PM programme or the 6 and 10 o'clock news. So you have got to understand the audiences. Mm. And, the, and the BBC constantly goes on about, it's the audience first. We're not doing this for us. Yeah. We're trying to think, what do our audiences want to hear? What do they not understand? What would inform them and help them make a choice in elections or things mm. like that? So I guess you, you've always got to temper what you're doing around... What have we already done for this audience? What do they need to know next? Mm. Uh, and where do we take it next? And also, what have other programmes already done? So not everyone starts from a standing start. The world at one is thinking, this is what today did. Where are we now going to take it? Mm. What attracted you to journalism? I mean, actually, funny enough, I think some people sort of always, always want to be a journalist. Mm. I absolutely am not that person. So in school... Like everybody else, probably you want to be a footballer, you want to be in the army, you want to be an ambassador, you want to be any number of things. Didn't do any real journalism at all until sort of final year of school when there was a kind of in-house magazine. I thought that would be kind of fun. But again, didn't really think much of it. And even leaving university, I had two jobs in that I went for Procter & Gamble marketing and got that. And went for the East Anglian Daily Times journalism and got that. And there was a kind of big choice between marketing gives you a car and a lot of money. <laughs> Journalism just sounded like a bit of fun and didn't involve Daz and Ariel and things like that. And in the end I just thought, if I'm going to do this for life, I'd like to do something that's kind of fun and allows me to be suitably inquisitive and find stuff out and enjoy my career. So, so far it's worked out okay. When you entered the industry, uh, I mean, that's as the big decision you made. Did, did you find it quite hostile or was it quite, uh, I mean, was it as fun as you'd hoped? Uh, yes, in terms of East Anglia Daily Times, doing all the training, learning shorthand and thinking, God, this is, you know, this is difficult and trying to work out what's the story, what's the top line, all the stuff you do in journalism. Yeah. And then about a year and a half in at East Anglia Daily Times, having done yet another appearance at sort of covering a magistrate's court or doing a... Um, and not belittling local journalism, but doing something really quite trivial, like the opening of a fate by the local mayor. Mm. I did begin to think, blimey, am I going to do this for the next 40 years? This would drive me bonkers. Um, but actually, it's a fantastic grounding, knowing how public administration works, knowing the law, knowing, as I say, shorthand. And so the timing's worked well. That after about two and a half years, I managed to get onto the training scheme at the BBC. And I wouldn't swap that initial bit for anything. It's fantastic mm. to do 
proper day-to-day -day local journalism, just reporting on villages and what people are bothered about. Mm. So on a on a day to day process such as today, what, what does a truck controller kind of do to affect the news that comes through the BBC? To be honest with you, one of the key things you do is ask questions, and it is as simple as that. It's mm. about be honest about what do I still not understand. So we've covered it all morning, but I still don't really get why this is happening. I mean, in fact, we've just had a meeting just then about tuition fees and about the Ed Miliband speech, yeah. and I'm still trying to get my head around. But why is he so wedded to this? If we've talked about what the impact is, we've talked about how he'd pay for it, whether it helps the poorest or the richest or whatever, but why is it a red line for him? And really just trying to go back to basics each time. Mm. And, and therefore just be nosy and just be absolutely honest about what I don't get is dot 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 and hope somebody somewhere is going to answer that. Because if I don't understand it, some of our listeners won't understand it, we'll also be asking the same question. Mm. Um, when you were an editor, what did you personally look for in a VT or a, a package? I mean, um, of course, you've kind of got a house style here at the BBC. You've got a house style at Sky News. You know, yeah. Sky News may kind of predominantly look for pictures. What did you personally look for in a VT? Well, we in a definitely VT? look for pictures. <laughs> yeah. I think they're quite handy. In yeah, a VT. of course. Yeah. I think, I think that what's interesting. I came in as a via papers and then predominantly radio. Hmm. And the thing that drives me nuts about telly, uh, and it's still a frustration, is sometimes we can get obsessed with something really quite technical, the, the brilliance of a graphic, or, um, and there's logistical hell of getting camera crew from A to B and mm. feeding all the stuff back. And I think sometimes, again, what is good in a VT is something that just makes you go, bloody hell, that's interesting. Mm. But, uh, not anything to do with the technicalities, nothing to do with the process of production, just it's a really good story. They've told it really clearly, and visually it's kind of grabbing me, and I'm not distracted and looking at my iPad or talking to my wife or mm. playing with the kids. I'm watching the VT. When you speak about relevance, I mean, um, with the kind of extreme steps that journalism is taking via kind of social media and technology, do you think the BBC might be struggling to kind of stay relevant, or like VTs or television with stuff like Twitter? I mean, do, do you think it's hard to kind of keep up? Yeah, I, I think all those are absolutely fair questions. I mean, relevance, above all, it is mm. actually the sort of priority. It's no good as putting out, again, very expensive or very cheap, brilliant programmes that nobody watches yeah. or nobody feels is relevant to their lives. And I do think the whole thing about Twitter and Facebook and any number of sort of, you know, apps, actually, that then if you see them as threats, I think you're losing the battle. Whereas if you see them as, hold on, if this is where people are going, and this is how people are accessing news, then great, that's where we'll go. Mm. And we'll put our news there. And we'll respond to what they want in the way they want to see it. So there's no good taking a, a VT package for the 10 and plonking it on Facebook. Yeah. People aren't consuming it in that way. But for me, I, I think, I mean, going back to the social media point, I don't think it's possible now to be a radio journalist or to be a TV journalist. You have to be able to do all these things, to be across all platforms, and clearly at the heart of that is digital. From your point of view, is it quite a priority right now in the upcoming to the general election to kind of enhance more public uh, you know, opinion and more public interaction? I think it's an absolute core goal. Hmm. It is, I mean, there's often been a, a debate actually about the BBC internally about, is it the BBC's job to get people to vote? Hmm. Or is it just the BBC's job to step back, inform, and you decide what you want to do? Yeah. I sort of come down on the side of, I think it is actually one of our jobs is to encourage people to vote in an inherently democratic thing. If we are a democratic, we're for democracy, we're for public understanding, why would we draw the line at getting people to vote? Yeah. Don't matter who they vote for, of course, that's their choice. If they want to spoil the ballot, that's fine. But it's an odd thing to not want to encourage people to participate in society in some way, and that's a pretty core cool way of doing it. So for us, it's absolutely about you know, exciting people, energising people about the election about the fact that it affects everything we will do for the next five years. People should be engaged in that. And if we don't engage them, then we have failed in a pretty fundamental way.